So today we're going to be in, we're going to start off actually in Ephesians chapter 6. So the last two weeks, we've been talking about being not ashamed of the gospel. And so if you remember, we talked about why would we be ashamed of the gospel? We talked through some of the excuses we may make for not giving the gospel and how to work through those and how to get better because our neighbors, they can't wait. We don't know how much time they have. We have to be bold for the gospel. That's easier said than done, right? So today we're talking about not being ashamed to pray for the gospel. There we go. I've got to find my notes here. So I'm going to give you guys four important aspects of praying for the gospel. The first one is to be ready. We need to pray to be ready to give the gospel. And that's what Ephesians chapter 6 is about. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, is all about us equipping ourselves, preparing ourselves day by day for the spiritual warfare that we're going to encounter that day. To wage war against the world and forces of darkness. So let's, let's read it. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His power, of His might, and put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. What in the world wants want to convince us otherwise? The world wants to convince you that your enemy is other humans, that your enemy is other people. But no, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people. It's, a, it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, we are to take up the full armor of God so that we will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. See, we fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight against the gates of hell. In fact, the early church, it was said of them that the gates of hell could not triumph against them. It is as though they were bursting through the gates of hell and snatching people out of the fire and claiming them for Christ. That's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be not ashamed of the gospel. If you remember last week, the, the atheist Penn Jillette, he even had appropriate view of those who give the gospel. He says, I have no respect for a Christian who doesn't give the gospel. Because if you truly believe that you know the way to eternal life, if you truly believe that people are going to hell and you don't tell them because it's socially awkward, you must really hate them. That was the way he put it. And that's, that's pretty strong words. And, and, you know, I know it's not because you hate them. It's because fear can make us hate. It can make us do acts of hate that we otherwise would not do. We have to be bold for the gospel. And the first step is putting on the armor of God, which is the gospel. Look at these different aspects of the armor. You know, it mentions truth. It means putting on what is true, not what might be true, but on truth. The truth that we can rest in, the gospel. To put on righteousness, not our own righteousness, Christ's righteousness. What Christ gave us. Resting on the fact that when we mess up, when we make a mistake that we don't sit there and, wall, and wallow in self-pity. But we know Jesus died for those sins so that I can live this new life and I'm going to walk forward knowing I'll stumble again, but knowing that I have Christ's righteousness. Knowing that he'll pick me up when I fall. We need to put on the preparation of the gospel of peace, the preparation, the, the feet that give the good news. To be prepared to give it every day. We need to put on faith. We need to wear our salvation proudly. And we need to go about with the Word of God, which is our sword, able to cut through bone and marrow to the intentions of the heart. That's the way Hebrews 4 puts it. These are the things we should arm ourselves with, and they all point towards the gospel, the good news. So it is important that we arm ourselves every day with the gospel but we cannot neglect prayer. It is the most important aspect of our prayers, and yet I feel like 
Most of our prayers have nothing to do with the gospel. But verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Who are you praying for? The saints, first and foremost. You're praying for those who are going to give the gospel. And Paul even asks, he says, verse 19, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We should be praying for one another that we would be bold in giving the gospel. I would even ask that you be able to pray for someone specifically in this room. I challenge you with that. Find somebody, at least, at least one person in this room. It doesn't have to be just one person. But find that one person and just pull them aside and say, hey, I'm going to be praying for you to give the gospel. And ask them, can you be praying for me? We need to be praying for each other with this, that we would have boldness to give the gospel, a boldness that comes from the Spirit of God. We ha cannot neglect to pray for the gospel, to pray for the harvest. Jesus himself emphasized that. In Matthew 9, he said, it says in verse 36 that he saw the crowds and he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast. They were sad like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, he turns to them in that, in that being moved by that same compassion for those people. And he looks at them and he says, the harvest is plentiful. Look at all these people, but the workers are few. Therefore, plead with the Lord, beg of him of the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers into his harvest, to send out those who will give his harvest. Telling them to be bold in praying for the gospel. So we need to, so we need to pray to be ready. We need to pray for ourselves to be ready. We need to be praying for each other to be ready. Praying for all the saints, making petition for them that they would be bold and able to give the gospel with clarity. The second part is we need to be directed. We need God's direction on us. In John chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, I want you to turn there with me because this is important. This is all about praying in Jesus' name. Which, by the way, is so much more than just using his name as a tagline at the end of our prayers. In fact, praying in Jesus' name meant asking God on behalf of Jesus to continue the work of Jesus. That's what it was all about. Don't believe me. Let me peel back this layer for you. John chapter 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Do you see what he's telling them? He's saying, ask of the Father that you may continue my work. Talking to his disciples about giving the gospel. With the disciples, he's telling them that with that, he's going to grant them signs and wonders. We don't quite have that same promise. You know, I don't see you guys going around miraculously healing people as you give the gospel. But when you pray in Jesus' name, remember that you're wanting to continue the work of Jesus. His work is not done, is it? No. So we ought to be praying in his name to be equipped to work, to do his work. Don't believe me, Acts chapter 4. That's like, you might want to warm up your Bible hands if you haven't already. Acts chapter 4. Going to verse 29. All right. These are the, the disciples. They're praying, and they're praying and making petition to the Lord. This is how they're praying in Jesus' name. Here's an example of it. And they're praying at a time when they, are, when they are just starting to meet some resistance from people around them. They're just starting to get a taste of the persecution that they're going to encounter. And so verse 29 of Acts chapter 4 says, And now, Lord, take note of their threats 
And grant that your bondservants, that your disciples here, may speak your word with all confidence, while you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, if you could take your mind off of signs and wonders and realize the main thing that God was granting them was that they would speak the word of God with boldness. That was the most important part. Can you speak the word of God with boldness? Praying in Jesus' name was so they were equipped to do that. Acts chapter 13 makes other mention of it. Verse 2 they're praying for direction of God. Where do, we send, where do we send Paul and Barnabas, these people that you have called out for your gospel? Where do we send them, Lord? Where are they to give the gospel? Where are you calling them? We need your direction. We need not just to be ready, but to be directed. And so here it says, they were ministering. They were ministering to the Lord in fasting. Fasting includes prayer. And typically you fasted if you were waiting on an answer for the Lord for direction. And it says, they were fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, who is Paul, for the work to which I have called them. Verse 3, then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They prayed for God's direction. Do we do that for the, each other? God, where are you sending me today? What opportunities are you going to give me today to be bold for your gospel? That's a scary prayer, isn't it? But man, if I could get most of you guys even to pray this prayer, we would really be effective in reaching this community. If we partnered with God and his mission, imagine what we could do. God's not done doing signs and wonders, and the greatest sign and wonder he can do is to transform a sinner to a saint. Final thing while we're in Acts chapter 14, one chapter away. Verse 3. See how they partnered with the Lord in speaking the gospel. It says, therefore, Acts chapter 14, verse 3, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. I love this. They were working alongside the Lord. Are we? If we're being honest, we could even say many of us, we're not even working, much less working alongside the Lord. So how do we get our idle hands working? How do we get them doing the will of the Lord? Prayer is the first step. So we must pray to be ready. We must ready ourselves through prayer, and we must be directed through prayer. But we cannot neglect, as we are pursuing the gospel, as we are doing our best to give it, to be thankful. That's so important. If you turn with me, Colossians chapter 4. Don't give up on those, on those uh, Bible hands. Come on, warm them up. Colossians chapter 4. I would love to just tell you these things, but I'm not a source of truth. The Bible is. So it's important you can see it from there. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. It starts off with the word devote. Commit yourselves. Give yourselves over to prayer. Okay, I see some pages still turning. All right, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thankfulness, of thanksgiving. So important. Prayers without thankfulness. When we are praying to give the gospel, when we are praying for the unsaved, a dissatisfaction can set in pretty quick because we neglect thankfulness. We end up having this entitled mentality that we're not meant to have. Instead of cheering on God and being filled with joy for Him, we're too focused on what we don't have. It is so important that we take pause to be thankful for what He has given to be thankful for the opportunities he's given, the things he has given, and stop focusing on what he has not. It is good that we pray for the gospel to go forward and for him to use us and for him to grant us opportunities, but we cannot neglect thankfulness. It's so important. 
Uh, there was a, a, a podcast called Unbelievable, and they're, and they're run by Christians, but they're dedicated to creating an active dialogue between Christians and atheists. And they challenged atheists to a 30-day challenge for them to pray to hear from God. Would you just pray for God to reveal himself to you for 30 days? And one of the, and, and several atheists actually that undertook this challenge came to faith. And, but one atheist, her name was, was Rachel Holmes. And during this time, as she was praying, she heard a still quiet voice say, do you want to not be sad anymore? Then be thankful. See, anytime you're praying to receive direction from God, anytime you're praying to God, it is important that you wait against his word because God does not contradict himself. But I'll tell you one thing, Satan is never going to tell you to be thankful to God. <laughs> that was the voice of God. Sadly, she listened to the voice of Satan there, which told her that was too simple of a truth. That must have been your own wisdom. And she said, oh, I, I must have come up with that myself. She wasn't thankful to God. We cannot neglect to be thankful. We cannot neglect that. So I challenge you too. If you notice that you have deep sadness in your life, that you are way too focused on what you have lost or what you don't have, to take your own 30-day challenge. A 30-day challenge to be thankful to the Lord and for him to reveal to you your next step, kind of combining step two and three there. So we need to be thankful. We need to be ready. We need to be directed. All these things are very important, but we cannot neglect. Once we've done the prayer, once we have bathed ourselves in prayer, once we have armed ourselves with the armor of God, to actually be bold. There comes a point where God has given you everything you need, and it's time to be bold. It's time to do the work. My um, mentor back in high school, the man who discipled me, he really took me under his wing. He noticed I loved gathering wisdom. I loved asking several people and really planning out my steps and being cautious with the way I moved. And he goes, Mace, now that's wise that you would do that. But I can't help but wonder if you're continuing to seek direction so you can avoid doing. I think you have enough information. It's time for you to do. It's time for you to employ it. So once you've prayed up, once you're ready, it is time. Well, I would say, don't just wait to be ready. Pray that God would ready you and then trust that he has made you ready. And then it's time to be bold. It's time to get out there and do. Um, and as you do, as you, as you are moved by prayer, it is important, so important. And this is where I may get a little harsh because the word is very clear on this. That our message is not one to take lightly. It is not one to sit on and be idle on. Acts chapter 18, I hope you can be encouraged by the example of, of Paul. I know you're probably thinking, weren't we just in Acts? Why can't you just combine these and make it easy on us? I did tell you to warm up the Bible hands. <laughs> Acts chapter 18, I'm gonna, we're going to go verse, start verse 3. I want you to see what Paul was doing here. All right. So Paul, someone who was bathed in prayer, who prayed himself, but also had many others gathered around him and praying that he could give the gospel with clarity. Verse 3, it says, And because Paul was of the same trade, he stayed with fellow co-workers, fellow co-laborers of the gospel, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. Verse 4, And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Notice this. It wasn't like he simply prayed for their salvation and then said, all right, God, go, you do. No, God wants to partner with us in reaching them. And he wants us to even reason with them. So he reasoned with them. He conversated with them, talked with them through the gospel. And then verse 5, And when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. Now that he had other men to take over the tent-making ministry, he devoted himself completely to giving the gospel, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. 
But then verse 6, But when they resisted and blasphemed, when they continued to resist Jesus and blasphemed him, he shook out his garments and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean, for now I would go to the Gentiles. It is so important that we do not neglect to give the gospel. I'm going to read you an Old Testament passage here from Ezekiel chapter 3, just so you know where I'm at. It's going to be verses 18 through, through 21. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, telling you about that person, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, and his blood I will require at your hands. That's some strong words. Because you notice here, it's kind of weird that Paul would say, your blood is on your own hands, right? He's pulling here from Ezekiel chapter 3. It, it goes on, actually. Take this warning and take it seriously. Yet if I warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his... Yet if you have warned the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, or from his wicked way, he shall die on his iniquity. But you have delivered yourself. And then get this, again... When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die, since you have not warned him. He shall die in his sin, and his righteous deeds which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. However, if you have warned the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning, and you have delivered yourself." When God calls us to give the gospel, because he has indeed warned us of the cost of sin, he has indeed warned us of what is to come, we then have the responsibility to give them the gospel, to tell them the way of salvation, to tell them the righteous way. But notice, how do we know the difference from whether we're speaking to a wicked man or a righteous man there? By the reaction to the correction. The wicked man is someone, when you warn them, they will reject the gospel and go on their way, doing what they please. The righteous man will hear the gospel and will respond to it and receive righteousness. In both cases, you have delivered yourself from that guilt. This is why when Jesus sent out his disciples, two by two, to go to people and tell them to repent for the kingdom is at hand, he said, if they reject you, shake off the bottom of your shoe. He told them to do that because he was saying, when you have been faithful to do what God has led you to do, then it's no longer your responsibility. We are to give the gospel. We are to reason to, with people. But when they know the gospel and they reject it, that's not on you. That is not your responsibility. You have delivered yourself from the guiltiness there. But when God has called you to give the gospel to those around you, do not neglect it. It is a strong thing. Like I said, Penn Jillette, that atheist, he was not far off. We have that responsibility. We do. But you may be thinking that the responsibility for someone to be saved completely falls on God. That there is no choice in the matter. And I want to talk about this real quick and correct this with my remaining time. That we are responsible for our choices, but not for others. And that sin is the act of the sinner, not the program of God. God did not program us to reject him. Now, God creates all kinds of people, and he lets them make their choices, and he knows the choices they're going to make for sure. But we may ask God, well, if you knew they were going to reject you, why did you make them in the first place? But that's when I've got to take you to Romans chapter 9. We're going to end here in Romans. I feel like our prayers are way too often about the sinner being saved. God, would you save that sinner? God, would you save that sinner? Would you lead them to salvation? And certainly, we want them to be saved, and we know that it is the work of God. It is the act of Christ who died for their sins. But you ought to understand, God himself has done what he is responsible for. He has sent Jesus, and Jesus has died for their sins. It's on them now. But you may say, why would he create them? knowing that they would still reject his gospel. To which case, we have to look in proper perspective. Verse 19 of Romans chapter 9. You will say to me then, 
Why does he still find fault for who can resist God's will, God's planning, the way he has made them? On the contrary, though, you should be considering this. Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder. The pot will not say to the potter. Why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not, the pot have a, does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Or one for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? What if God, knowing that person was still going to reject him, yet made him anyways, giving him every opportunity to know the gospel and turn to it, and endured with much, and endured with much patience this person who would dishonor him for throughout their entire life to make known his justice. Verse 23, And he did so to make known... Uh, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Now the picture there of that verse, verse 22, is what if. We need to understand this. Paul was giving a what if here, so that we can properly look at the potter, and instead of asking, God, why did you make me this way? You would ask the right question, which is, God, what would you have me do? We shouldn't ask God, why did you make me this way? Why did you make him that way? It's God, what would you have me do? We're not to question the potter. We're to trust him. And we must look at this verse in context. We must look back to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for good to those who love God. That's such an important promise to remember. If you love God, if that person loves God, things will work together for good. At the same time, we must also look forward to Romans 10, 13 through 15. And this is where I want to end. 10, 13 through 15. Your responsibility is to reason with people, to give them the gospel, to make sure they understand it. That is most important. Not to question the potter, but to trust him that he is a good God and to do his will. Romans 10, 13. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is a surefire promise. Whoever. Whoever. Do you get that? It is not whether God chose them beforehand or not. It's whoever would. Okay? See, theology is, is most unhelpful when we put God in a box and we exclude ourselves from personal responsibility. That is not the point of theology. So for whoever will call in the name of the Lord will be saved because we have that surefire promise, because we know whoever can be saved. We are to be so faithful in giving it. Verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. And how will they hear without a preacher? Not just talking about me, not us talking about people behind the pulpit, talking about those who are proclaiming Christ to people everywhere. That's you guys. And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. Which I point back to Ephesians chapter 6. Aren't we all to arm ourselves with the, gospel, with the armor of God, which includes the readiness to give the gospel? The feet that bring the good news? Aren't we all to do that? Yes. We all should be giving the gospel. So I, I encourage you to pray then something like this, and this comes from a song actually, uh, sung by Jeremy Camp called Move in Me, and it's based off Paul. And I love this. Listen to this, and I hope it encourages you. I'm knocking on doors. God, you're holding the keys. Maybe they'll open. Maybe they're not for me. I'm setting the cells, Lord. You ready the seas, but I won't make a move till you move in me. So we must be ready through prayer. We must be directed through prayer. We must be thankful in our prayers. And then we have to be bold. Let's pray. God, we need you. Help us, Lord, to acknowledge our shortcomings in giving the gospel. God, the people we have neglected to give the gospel to. And just the power of a simple question. 
What do you think about Jesus? God, help us to be bold. Help us to pray for one another. God, help. I, I pray, Lord, please provide for each and every brother and sister in Christ here that one person who will pray for them and that one person that they can pray for. God, I pray that you would help us to look at you and truly see you as the wonderful and gracious God that you are who didn't have to go out of his way to save us from our sins that very well could have judged us appropriately for our sins that you went out of your way to send Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us, Lord, to make the gospel known to anybody. And God, help us to trust you with them. So I pray, Lord, today, would you send out workers into your harvest here in this community? We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.